for me, dragging myself out to another place after a work day is, is a pretty big deal, so I really appreciate everybody coming out here. If um, at any point I start speaking too quickly or mumbling, um, just like put your hand up and I'll speak up and slow down. Um, so a little bit about this talk. Um, I put the word hacking there. I'm not a developer. I just like to say hacking. It doesn't mean anything. Um, it's just, uh, what I want to talk about today is just, uh, Sergey asked me when we were talking about things that I could come here and talk about, um, to, uh, if I would be interested in doing a talk on the psychology of performance. And I kind of had this little, oh, but I think I've talked about that a lot. And then I realized, actually, I've never talked about that. It's never been a, a talk that I've done. I've, I've written blog posts about it, and I've sort of alluded to it in various other things that I've written and in various other talks that I've done. But I've never done an entire talk on this. So um, this is a, a brand new set of slides. Nothing can, so uh, I hope you like it. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, this is how to find me on Twitter if you want to connect. Um, I blog at performancebeacon.com along with uh, some other really smart people and some stuff. And um, I also co curate with Tim Cadillac from Akamai, um, the PPOSCAS.com, which Sergey already told you about. And it's, just, uh, it's a collection of, of completely data driven case studies and research around uh, the various business and user experience uh, benefits of, of, of companies and organizations to optimize. Um, this is the book that I just finished writing. It's um, the, the the copy that's here is actually like a preview edition. So O'Reilly does this thing where they'll um, for some of their books they'll release one or two in advanced chapters and they'll find it. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoy that. But it's just this kind of slim preview of the actual book, which will be out next month in hardcover, hard copy, and also um, as a, as a, as a e book. So. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know when it's out because I'll be writing about it in my house. <coughs> so, um, I want to talk a little bit. I uh, thought uh, really set up the premise for this talk really well. Um, when, he, when we were talking earlier about um, just everybody wants a magic number for what's fast enough. So, that's probably like uh, if I put together an FAQ of questions that I get asked, the number one question in the top three would be. Um, how fast is fast enough? What's the, what's the sweet spot? And there's not really a precise answer to that question. And I can see people always look disappointed when I tell them that because they want there to be a precise answer to that question. Um, it just comes down to so many things and it's so hard to measure. So what I'm going to talk about today is just the, 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 um, the human factor side of our expectations and then some things we can do to help enhance that feeling that, that science can be faster. What I'm not going to do Tell you how fast it's fast enough. So if you're coming here from the I'm really sorry. But we can have a fascinating conversation about why that's difficult a little bit later. Um, so this is a, uh, from a study that uh, came out from One to One Internet um, a couple of years ago. And they found that 71% of users are basically dissatisfied with the performance of the sites they visit. And I actually thought that was that was a really optimistic number. I would have thought it'd be like 99%. But um, apparently, 49% of the internet users are actually looking at the top of the website. What's really interesting to me out of the same study is was, it was this stat. They asked people, how much time uh, do you think you spent waiting for pages to load? And this is a crazy The average person in this survey, and they surveyed hundreds of people, said that they felt they would spend nine minutes every day waiting for pages to load. And nine minutes seems crazy to me. Like, I don't think I use the internet all day long. I don't think I spend nine minutes waiting for pages to load. But this is really interesting because it's not about how long you actually spend waiting for pages. It's how long the average person, so not you or me, but just the average person that really uses the internet, feels that they spend waiting for pages to load. And that adds up to two days a year, um, which is, again, a super crazy number. But just something to kind of go away and think about when you think about how people perceive um, the, the internet as a whole. Oh, really? Am I not hearing? Is this better? Yeah. Oh, okay. Much better. Sorry. I can hear myself totally clearly, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, everybody got that part? Nine minutes a day, two, day, or two, uh, two days a year. So, crazy, right? Um, there's a study that I really like, another survey, because. Um, 
It's interesting. What we do at Sobsta is we use actual user data to measure how people um, spend time on the websites that, that use our beacons. And wait a second. And then, um, and then we can measure the impact of how uh, how quickly those pages loaded people on things like bounce rate and session length and revenue and conversions and uh, all kinds of really cool metrics. And that's really interesting because it's 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 real. Um, but surveys are interesting too. And um, I will do a whole other talk where I kind of poo-poo surveys because I want people to understand that data is really important. But in this one, I'm actually going to focus on why I think surveys are really interesting. And the reason why is because it just gives us this insight into what people are actually thinking um, about how they use the web. So this optimized survey basically found that um, more than half of people expect pages to load in two seconds or less. Um, I don't know if you can do that right now. Um, and then uh, this other shot, this, this gold shot you hear at the top um, about 20%, maybe 18 or 19%, um, expect pages to load instantly. So this is what people say they want from their from online experiences. Um, some more cool stuff. I'm just going to kind of give you a little bird's eye view of a whole bunch of different uh, pieces of research. Um, this is from a piece by Stone and Stefanoff, who wrote um, a piece called The Psychology of Speed. And these are the dramatics I wanted to be. Um, the middle red, the middle red uh, clock shows the perceived uh, time of a. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry again. The actual is on the gold, uh, the gold clock, which is um, so. Say, so imagine that the average page takes 10 seconds to load. The average person perceives that page is actually taking 15% longer to load than it actually did. And then later on, if you ask them to recall how long the page took to load, um, they actually recall it as being 35% slower than it was. So it's not just that people have uh, sort of faulty internal clocks when it comes to um, thinking about how, how fast a page is. It gets even worse whenever they re whenever they remember the experience later on. So something to bear in mind that we get really hung up on load time or document complete or start render or all those things. But what those what those hard and fast metrics aren't telling us are what do people actually feel the page is living in. It would be great if we could have a whole other dashboard that just tells you people's thoughts and feelings, but um, that that might slow us down a little bit. Um, there's a really neat um, study by um, folks at webperf.io where they looked at how people, uh, what page people came from before they came to a page. And what was really interesting here is, I don't know if you can read this, um, the bottom line is direct. So people who just like, landed, the, like, typed the URL to their the browser and, and, and got to the page. Then search is the line above that. And Facebook is the, is the line above that. So choose the referring sites. And what was really interesting is when you look at the bounce rate by, uh, uh, across load times by those different traffic sources, what's really interesting is you see that the bounce rate for the people coming from Facebook is super, super high. What's interesting to me about this is when you think about, I mean, I don't know about how, how you guys experience Facebook. I live in the middle of nowhere with terrible internet. And even for me, Facebook is pretty fast. So um, when you think about the contact sensitivity of speed, anybody who is using Facebook, which is pretty speedy by most accounts, and then coming to another site, that site is relatively speaking going to feel slower by virtue of the site that by virtue of comparison to Facebook. <laughs> so it's really interesting to think about the fact that um, you know we can it, it, it makes you realize how ephemeral that hard and fast low time number is when for you know, the same cohort of users, um, they're more prone to bounce if just because they happen to be on a preceding page that was, that was much faster than yours. So well, one thing I wanted to say, if, if anybody has a question at any point, like just put up your hand because otherwise um, my mouth gets really dry and I don't get a chance to get through the water. So there you go. Direct is referring to what exactly? The average websites out there? As so so direct is somebody just typing the URL into the browser, okay. and, or like going into their history or something like that, and, and, and getting it that way. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was, uh, does direct mean? Uh, what does direct mean? So I was just clarifying that direct means that he's typing the URL right into the browser from their bookmarks. So now I have a question. Yeah. So do you believe that uh, this curve is specific to 
what people's uh, uh, intent on Facebook is, or is it because the Facebook app or website is fast? So this is uh, we get into the realm of extrapolation, which always makes me nervous because um, my so my best guess is that um, it's it's that speed is, is is a factor. So because we're, it's the one, I mean, there might be other factors. It might be that somebody who's coming to a page um, for Facebook is just clicking on the link, and maybe it's just it was just a, a, a crap ad on Facebook, and they didn't want to, you know, they realized, oh, I didn't want to go to this page after all because people put dodgy ads on Facebook sometimes. So there's that that comes into it as well. But yeah. I'm sorry. That's not the case. People actually cross the same. Yeah, I don't know what to. Uh, I don't know how to account for that. To be honest, not my data, so uh, <laughs> I get to just wash my hands and step aside. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to account for that. But yeah, there's there's a lot of factors that come into it. Yeah, just something to something to be aware of. Like how people. And this is something that we see on on uh, with, when we look at data at SOSTA, which is that um, you can't think that there's just one ideal load time when you think about just yourself as a user, anecdotally, um, if, you, if you're in a hurry, your expectations are going to be, are going to be different. If you are, um, if you're just in a bad mood, if you're tired, you know, there's so many different things that can affect your browsing context that um, that, that, that hurt fast single load time just doesn't, doesn't work. So I really like this quote from Steve Souders. Um, I, uh, I think this came from Web Per Days in Amsterdam in the fall, or maybe it came from a recent blog post, I can't recall. Uh, but I wrote it down at the time and, uh, and just thought this was really cool. So, at the end of the day, when we're building pages or doing whatever it is we do to make pages more performant, um, just keep in mind that what we're doing is just trying to alter people's perception of the page. And I think that's I said you take away and kind of, you know, slam in your, your mental features board. Okay. And then speaking of quotes, I really love this one. Um, a few years ago, the New York Times did a piece on um, Google. At, at the time, Google was getting a lot of press because they were being very public about their stated uh, goals for load times. And it was that like kind of 100 milliseconds or less uh, piece. And so they did a really good piece. You can look it up. It's still online, I believe, uh, for Asian web users. I believe it's too long to wait. Um, and there were a lot of comments on it. And I thought it was, it, the comments were really interesting. Some of them were really funny. Um, some people um, were like, you know, well, hey man, like maybe slow web pages are just a sign that we just slow down and you know just be groovy about it. Um, and we should take it as like as, a, as an opportunity to become better people, which is nice, I guess. Um, I'd like to become a better person other ways, but that's just me. Um, this one made me laugh because it was just uh, you know some people just really. Um, believing that our expectations are just because we're impatient, because we just want things when we want them, and this is just a product of our, our greedy, selfish generation, whether we're Gen Xers or Millennials or Gen Y or whatever you subscribe to. Um, and I use this quote to kind of practice the next uh, bit of, of this talk, which is actually the, the, the neuroscientific research behind why we have the expectations that we have and why delivering faster pages isn't just catering to increasingly impatient generations of uh, young people, but actually has its roots in, in just how we're wired. So this um, is, this little chart here is based on um, a recurring research from Jacob Nielsen. How many people here are familiar with Jacob Nielsen? It's a lot of people, okay. Um, so Jake Nielsen is kind of a usability guru. He was, uh, I've been doing user experience stuff for about 20 years and uh, been sort of a, a disciple for, for that long. Um, and what he's been doing for about 20 years-ish um, is um, revisiting his original research that he released in the 90s, which was around what are our expectations when it comes to response time. This is actually taking people in a lab and seeing how they react whenever they are um, they are experiencing pages with different levels of delay. 
and so I won't read this out to you. But you can see that it ranges from 100 milliseconds for this illusion of instantaneous page loads all the way to a few 10 seconds when people just kind of lose focus and they have a really hard time getting back on board. The interesting thing about this research is he revisits it. You know, he's not just sort of resting on 25 year old research. He's, um, so he, he, he checks in with this and it's, it's held true. So this is just a sign that this, these expectations are really hardwired. They're not something that we have a lot of control over. We might think that we're teaching ourselves to be more patient, and, um, and, and to some degree, you know, we can. But that idea that um, we can maybe be more patient and lower expectations isn't actually going to change what's happening with us at a neurological level, like when the pages are getting slow. It's just not, not something that we have a lot of control over. Um, let's see. So, just going even further back, how many people know about the persistence of vision, um, like the early, early studies that are like, I feel like I should remember this, 200 years ago, 400 years ago, hundreds of years ago, I used to, I, I, I wrote about it in my book, but I'm terrible with dates, so, um, but it's, it's in there. Um, and the earliest studies into persistence of vision um, involved tying a glowing ember to a carriage wheel and spinning it around. And I can't remember the name of the scientist, it's in the book. Um, and what, but what he found was that 100 milliseconds is uh, the speed of the, the, the spinning wheel um, uh, was enough to create the illusion that the circle was unbroken, the circle of, of, of light was unbroken. So that's basically how our eyes work. It's how our eyes send messages to our brain and then our brain stores it in our iconic memory. So the iconic memory is the part of your brain that you have no control over this, by the way. It just it just takes in visual information, holds it for a few seconds, it decides whether it's useful or not, and then, and then it shuts it or, or then pushes it into short-term memory. Maybe I need to hold on to this for a little longer. So when Google has uh, its stated goal of 100 millisecond load times, I don't think it's a coincidence that that number also corresponds to this persistence of vision research. It's, again, that idea of, of instantaneous, uh, the illusion of instantaneous response. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And uh, this is, uh, again, a great quote from um, Urs Bolsel, who at the time is senior chief technical infrastructure at Google, basically uh, explicitly saying that they wanted to be just like flipping pages in a book. Any questions about that? I should just go back. Yeah. Well, so, so there's, I don't know if I can say this right, but so page loads and it's very, very fast. But I've noticed that, say, with React-based websites and that, or React apps and that sort of thing, there's a there's a transition. There's a uh, an animation of of that change, and to me, that seems a lot faster. Particularly, you know, that you go bam and then bam, as opposed to the React-based stuff is more transitional. You know, if that impacts um, perception of performance. I mean, if, if somebody's studied that. That's a good question. So just repeat it for people. Um, you're asking, and clarify if getting this wrong, if um, the movement towards having React-based, like single page apps or pages with, with transitions, yeah, animated, yeah, animated yeah. transitions, um, has it, have there been any studies about how that has improved the perception of performance? And there, there haven't been, um, but it's a really, it's, it's a really good question. Yeah, and not, not that I know about, and I, I try to keep my ears open. I don't know, is he ref referring to the illusion of speed as opposed to actual speed? In other words, on purpose to have a few items in the beginning and let the rest download afterwards? Is that what he's referring to? Well, the transition from one page to another where where the transition is actually, in a way, slower, but but it seems like it's faster. Yeah. Because you don't have, a, you don't have a, an abrupt transition. Yeah, so, the, so the it's planned that way. It's planned that some items will come and keep you busy while the rest is coming, so it can give you the illusion. I think that's what he's referring to. Yeah, so I mean, I, um, so just to clarify, what you're saying is just that um, it's that idea that something is being served, like you're seeing something in terms of transition that's giving you the illusion of. Uh, yeah. So. Nothing's been done specifically with that, although there has been research into um, that, that, that I've actually worked on into um, m most comparable thing I can think of is uh, progressive images versus images, like baseline images. And I actually have got some slides about that. But 
I don't want to. I don't want to overly commit to saying that those are directly analogous, but you know, you might find something interesting in there. But it would be good to do a study about that. I fully agree. So um, a while back, I, I worked for a company called Radware. We did a lot of original research, and we worked with a neuroscientific research firm, third-party um, uh, company called Neurostrata, who helped us do some really neat stuff where we would bring our test participants into a lab, into a neutral setting, and specifically we wanted to test um, how they perceived mobile pages uh, whenever uh, we introduce artificial delays. So what that involved, actually I wish that I had included this slide, it's really cool. Um, you can now get EEG headsets. They used to be these like crazy, massive, scary things that weighed about 50 pounds. Now you can get these really lightweight EEG headsets that you put on people so they can not sort of forget that they're there. <clears throat> and, um, and, and and actually gauge uh, different different uh, responses to the, their, their their feelings about uh, experiences. So what we did was because it was a UK based study, um, we tested EasyJet and Ryanair as two um, uh, flight booking sites, and John was in Tesco as two big retail sites. And we had these people come into the lab put on the headsets, we gave them tasks to complete, we told them that they were just doing a regular usability study, um, but they didn't know that there was a performance element to it at all. And we divided people up into different cohorts, and for different cohorts we introduced a 500 millisecond uh, HTML delay, so just artificial, artificially, oh sorry, sorry, I'm thinking different study. We, um, and we brought all the connection. So they all, uh, so those people got different, uh, different uh, load time delays. And what was really interesting was that for um, these mobile shoppers, you could see um, the things that we looked at were um, uh, increases in engagement and, uh, and decreases in engagement and increases in, in, we called it kind of web stress and decreases in web stress. And so what you see is that um, for the John Lewis site, um, we saw a 26% increase in, in, in stress, basically people having a hard time maintaining focus while pages were rendering. And you see the same thing with the EasyJet site, uh, with Ryanair site. We saw some weird decreases in, um, in <laughs> on the Tesco site, so we're still trying to figure that out, to be honest. So I, I, I can't even explain what was going on there. Yeah. There are always outliers. This is what you have to look at your own data. Um, just, just some interesting perceptual stuff. And bear in mind, these are all pages that were pretty fast. Um, we, the baseline speed for most of them was, you know, for mobile was, um, you know, uh, document complete in about three and a half, four seconds. Um, start render in about two seconds or so under the, under the, under the optimal conditions. So we're not talking about massive differences in, in, in load time. But we were seeing quite significant differences in people's levels of engagement and, and irritation. Oh, and then that's um, so. This is uh, this is actually uh, this set of slides is actually about engagement. So the previous one was about stress. This is what this is about engagement. So you see that engagement decreased for um, all the sites, except that it slightly increased for Ryanair. So again, you know, the, 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 I could uh, theorize about this all day long. We sort of had this conjecture that you know, when we looked at the checkout page for Ryanair, that um, that. It was just a really nice checkout page, so we thought maybe people just like it. I don't know, maybe we have no idea. But almost more interesting than the neuroscientific aspect of what we did was we gave exit surveys to all the people who participated in the study. And so what that meant was um, after they had uh, completed their, their tasks on a site, we asked them, what did you think of the site? What did you think of the content? What did you think of the navigation? What did you think of the design, et cetera? The way you would on a, on a traditional usability test. And we fed um, all of the adjectives that they gave us, this is actually for the Tesco website. Um, I, I, I pulled this one randomly, but we fed all the adjectives that um, all of our, our participants gave us into word cloud generators. And what was interesting was that for the cohort of people that experienced the faster site, um, they tended to use more positive words. People still said negative things because, you know, this is the internet and nobody's ever happy about 100% of the things. But they generally said that it was it's pretty easy to use, easy to buy from, pretty quick, user-friendly, that sort of thing. There's an ugly down there, but, you know, 
we can say what's probably it's pretty subjective. Um, on the slow side, what's really interesting, the first thing that's jumping off the screen, um, hopefully at you, is the fact that there are so many words. People just had more to say about the slow site. They wanted to talk about it longer, and they wanted to tell us why they thought it sucked. Um, they said that it was slow, so it was interesting when they noticed, even though it wasn't painfully slow, they, 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 people noticed that, and it was, it was the number one uh, adjective that was, that was thrown at us. They said it was boring, clunky, sluggish, tacky, childlike, hard to navigate, inelegant, which is an interesting word choice, frustrating, confusing. There's some nice words in there as well. But what's really interesting is that you have, there are about three times as many negative words in this word cloud as there are negative words in the, the word cloud for the vast site. Um, and what's really interesting is that how many of those negative words have nothing to do with performance. They have to do with the content, they have to do with the design, they have to do with the navigation and overall usability of the site. So even though all of the things were equal, there were no, there were no differences between these, these, these two experiences as a performance, people's perception of the entire brand was negatively affected by, by the performance. The words trustworthy confuses me. Why trustworthy? It sounds like you should be untrustworthy. Uh, so the question is, the word trustworthy is confusing because you would think it's untrustworthy. Like I said, there were people had positive things to say that might have had as much to do with um, the pre like kind of pre uh, previous brand perception because these are household name sites in the, in the UK. So people would just know about them and thought, well, you know, yeah, I like, I like John Lewis or Tesco. Um, you know, it's, it's a good site. So, I want to move along and talk about um, another. So, this is a, a actually based on a post that I wrote um, when I worked at a company called Strange Loop um, several years ago, which was an acquired by Redware. Um, and they have a blog, they still have a poem in performance today, which I have a lot of posts for. And um, it's probably the only time I think anybody's ever written about the intersection of web performance with colonoscopies. So, I'm pretty proud of that. Um, colonoscopies. So. <laughs> Um, so, and, and, and it's definitely a bit of a stretch, so, so you're going to have to follow me here for a little bit. Um, there's a lot of interesting research around how the tail end, no pun intended, I'm so sorry, of any experience. <laughs> I do that all the time, it's just terrible. Um, the, uh, the end of the experience. Uh, again, um, is uh, actually is, uh, feeds our, per our overall perception of that experience um, more than the previous, you know, whatever, however many minutes that experience was. And one of the most interesting studies around this, um, there's one that's like kind of, that's kind of neat, it's where uh, people were uh, told to submerge their hands in, in ice cold water and, and stuff like that. But I'm going to talk about the colonoscopy one because it gets people's attention. So what you see here are um, uh, two different patients who experienced colonoscopies. So, um, but just in chart form, I'm not going to show you the actual pictures. Um, and you can see that for patient A, the experience was really brief. It was, it was, it was less than 10 minutes. For patient B, it was two and a half times longer than that, which sounds absolutely awful. Um, and you see also for patient B that so the, these spikes are pain, are pain intensity. So you see for patient A, two major, you know, intense pain spikes that ended up roughly just before 10 minutes. And then for patient B, you see almost equally intense pain spikes and a lot more pain spikes. Like this, that just gives you shivers just looking at it. Um, and but it tapers off at the end. I'm kind of, I'm gonna give it, I, I, I give it away, but how many, what, who do you think walked away from that experience and said that their experience was worse? Patient A or patient B? Patient A. Patient A, even though it was a shorter experience, had fewer pain spikes, because the experience ended horribly painfully for them, according to their perception, they took away, they, they, uh, they, they said it was awful. Um, so it's just really interesting. They, uh, the, the cold water experiment is an interesting one as well. It's sort of similar, but not you know, quite as, as, as radical as this, where they um, asked people, well, which, which experience would you rather repeat? Because they had people do both. And uh, people would rather repeat the longer experience that ended um, less painfully 
than the shorter, more intense experience. Uh -huh. So it's kind of crazy. And even, even though you, you, you can tell somebody point blank, but that, like, but that other experience is going to be much longer and more drawn out, and people will still choose the longer drawn out tapering off experience. And um, maybe there are outliers, maybe there are exceptions, but there's a lot of research to show that this is, this is a fairly common trait amongst most people. What does this have to do with web performance? I'm going to ask myself that question. Um, what it has to do with web performance is we, when we measure experiences, we often focus on the home page. Everybody, when it, you know, I talk to a lot of companies, and everybody wants to make sure their home page is fast. Whenever they do competitive benchmarking, they want to see how fast their home page is compared to other people's home page. But what's interesting is um, no, very few people look at the performance of the end pages of a transaction and realize that actually the performance of those pages really colors um, really colors people's perception of the overall experience. So you might think, well, you know, people completed the transaction or finished whatever they came to do on the site, therefore, you know, boom, we've got a happy user and they left. But if if the, that tail of the experience was uh, suddenly slowed down, um, it, really, it, it affects retention. When I was at Strangeloop, we did a study where we, uh, it was an artificial delay study, where we uh, divided people into three cohorts of traffic. The goal bar represents the optimized uh, traffic, people who, who had a fairly speedy experience. Um, group two, group two, um, were people who uh, we introduced an uh, artificial delay to page one of a three-page uh, flow in the site, and group three we introduced an oh sorry sorry I'm getting these backwards. Group two uh, we introduced an artificial um, uh, one second delay two, no two second delay to page three of the transaction, and group three we introduced it to the first page of the transaction. And so what's interesting here is that. Um, not surprisingly, the event rate was low as for the, the, the fully optimized set of pages, um, and that the abandonment rate was really high for people who um, received a, a poor experience on the first page of the transaction. But what's really interesting is that the abandonment rate is almost as high for people who experience uh, a slowness on the third final page of the transaction. So it just goes to show that you can think that you've got people committed to following through on something on your site, but um, but if you're just worried about optimizing the first few pages in a flow and missing that last page, you could be missing an opportunity to, you could be, uh, A, people could be bouncing, or B, you could be affecting that perception of the overall experience of your site. A different study that we did at Strange Loop um, was uh, we introduced uh, a couple of different, a couple of delays, 500 millisecond delays to the overall experience, and 1,000 millisecond delays to the overall experience, and then we had a baseline group. And we did this study over 18 weeks, and for the first 12 weeks, we um, introduced the delays to these cohorts, and we measured the return rate to the site. And so you can see that the return rates here are, um, so this is your, your uh, your your slowest group with the one second delay, and this is the fastest group with the optimized set of pages. And you can see that um, the return rate kind of varies between 39 to 42 percent for the optimized group, and um, it kind of it just, you know kind of lags along the bottom for the, the one second delay group. Um, so we weren't really surprised by that, um, but it was you know validated some stuff that we were looking for, and so keep validating your assumptions. Um, but what was really interesting was we tracked those users for six weeks after we um, started serving everybody optimized experiences again. So everybody's actually experiencing um, pages that are fully optimized. And what's interesting was that it was only at the six week after the experiment ended mark that those three lines started to converge again. And in an ideal world where um, storing millions and millions of pages where the data doesn't cost a lot of money, it would have been great to just keep doing this, this, this experiment in perpetuity. Because I, think, I, I was just curious to know, do those lines ever converge? Or have you just permanently lost some of those people that just won't come back? Mm -hmm. But it was just interesting enough to know that it took six weeks for, for um, that, that return pattern to, uh, to significantly recover. Mm -hmm. so any questions about any of this so far? Yeah? Have you ever done a study like this just on like a single event average, like a site's down for an hour? Or so that's a really good question. I, I haven't, but Akamai has. And they've measured, I don't know if it's, 
Oh, sorry. Um, uh, the question was, have we ever done a study, or do I know of any studies, where um, some of these measured uh, user metrics in terms of outages, not just slowdowns? And so um, I don't think it's in my slides, but um, I'm going to try to remember the numbers. I really need prompts because I, I have numbers going through my brain all day long, so it's hard to take them down sometimes. But um, they found that um, if, if sites were slow, they experienced a 28% permanent abandonment rate. And I can't remember how they defined slow. I think if you if you come to me afterwards, I, I can give me your, your contact info, I can send you the study. Um, that if the site had an outage, there was only a 9% permanent abandonment and abandonment rate. So abandonment is actually much higher when um, there are performance issues than when there are outage issues. Which kind of makes sense when you think about it intuitively, like um, if a site goes down, we know sites go down, it kind of sucks, but you try again later. There's a really great quote from Lenny Ruchinski, who's now the, I think, a head of product at um, Airbnb. Um, before he was at Airbnb, he was a company, had a company called Ustar, and he said that if a site um, if a site goes down, you just try again later. If a site's just always slow, you just start hating it, you don't go back. So that's, uh, I think I put a lot. Um, Okay, so this is actually just some, some of the additional metrics from the from the from this research, where we just found that uh, the, the the slower cohorts, five millisecond, thousand millisecond delays, um, affected bounce rates and conversion and page views, not surprisingly. <laughs> so what can we do? And I, I full caveat: I'm not a developer, I, so anything that I tell you now is I'm very academic and. No, you're not going to see any snippets of code up here or anything like that. But um, Ilya Gorek, uh, who um, I'm sure many of you here have heard of, um, had this great quote that the time is measured objectively but perceived subjectively, and experiences can be engineered to improve perceived performance. I thought, you know, as always, Ilya always nails stuff very succinctly, so that's just a great quote. Mm. So I want to talk about some things that we can do to make changes at least seem to be faster. And um, definitely feel free to jump in if you've got personal experience to, to add a little bit of color to what I'm about to say, or um, if you know anything that directly contradicts anything that I'm about to say, I'm, I'm here to learn too. So the first thing that comes up when people think about improving the perception of performance is progress indicators, including progress indicators. This is great. Um, I love a good progress indicator. In fact, I have a collection of, of um, visuals with progress indicators um, at home and mm -hmm. always collecting more. Um, has anyone seen, does anyone play Minecraft? Does anyone here have kids who play Minecraft? Okay, there you go. So you probably play Minecraft. Um, and what I love about how Minecraft loads is um, when, it's, when, it, when it's, it's loading on your phone or whatever, um, it's just initializing worlds, generating terrains. It's just not, it's not generating terrains. I mean, you know, for kids, it's really, really helpful stuff. You're just seeing this if you read Minecraft background, and it's telling you, the progress indicator is telling you how it's creating the world for you. And my kids happily just sit there and wait for their world to generate. Like, they, they're like, yeah, this is, this is serious business, so, you know, I'm just going to be like, sit here while well, this is happening. Um, and so it's just, it's just really interesting how we can, we can uh, I use that as kind of a, maybe not something we can do on, the, on, on most of our websites, but just uh, to, to just think cleverly about how we can use progress indicators. So some best practices, and um, you know, I stand, oh yes? Uh, forgive me if you'll get to this, but uh, have you seen studies or differences on the impact between no indicator an indicator with low target end and one showing progress toward a, what could be a fake end but still showing progress. I feel like I have. I'm not going to say it today, but there's a lot of really good usability and performance related research around progress indicators. So I'm basically giving like a just a bit of the greatest hit stuff today, but um, if you want to um, again contact me and send me your question, I'd be happy to dig it up because that's the kind of thing I'm just finding out as well. Oh, sorry, I'm so bad at repeating the question. The question was, is there any good research about um, the impact of, of just creating your, your indicators in different ways, like showing an end mark versus no end mark, um, or just having it kind of spin eventually? So, 
just a few, as I said, greatest hits. Um, pieces. Um, Luke Robleski um, collected some great stats around progress indicators um, in a roundup. So I grabbed a couple of these from, from a blog post he wrote. And basically, um, if you use progress indicators on pages that generally render in less than five seconds, this is where you do have to grasp how your pages are rendering for, you know, 90% of users um, will make the page actually feel slower instead of faster. So um, that's something that's, that's really good to know. Best case is 10, 10 seconds or more, and be pretty confident that the pages are taking that long to render, and then make sure that you get them off the page if you do something awesome and make that page load faster later. So this, and this is what I think that with the question that you asked, um, was actually addressed in another piece that I read where I extracted this from, but there's a, a, a great post sitting out there that I can find, and, and I, I'm going to be actually writing a blog post about this talk, so there'll be a lot of links in there. Um, basically, if, if you have the illusion of a left-moving ripple, you can improve perceived perception of, of, of performance by up to 10%, which is really, really interesting. Um, Hey, not a right, not a right movie ripple, left movie ripple. So, it's probably the best. Yes, it's growing and then it's a little bit That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a really good um, uh, uh, little snippet that I used to use, um, but it was posted somewhere else and then they, they disappeared, so I realized I should have actually grabbed it and made my own copy of it. So. So another good one, um, and uh, progress bars that pulse, and it pulse faster as you get closer to your your end date, or perceived to be faster. So from that, I would actually kind of extrapolate that if a progress indicator should show that something is is, is happening, you're moving towards an end target. Although having said that, I remember um, a couple of years ago doing something on my Mac, and it was telling me that it was it was going to be three minutes. It was a really long three minutes. It was like I was, it was just like, like an Apple three minutes was, it was more like about seventy two minutes. Um, so watching so having so the uh, system tell you that it's going to be three minutes, and you're watching it patently not be three minutes is um, because that, cause then you're just kind of in free fall. It's kind of like like having friends who never show up places on time. So you try to agree on like where to be at a certain time, and then you just don't even know when they're going to. You don't know when to be there. It's like that. It's that, it's that sense of just time really to free fall that I personally find very unnerving. And progress bars that speed up as you get closer to to the finish are considered more satisfying. So again, you just, going back to the colonoscopy research, right? Like, oh, it's getting faster. Oh, it's getting longer really quickly. So you know, people people like that. It creates a bit of energy towards it creates some energy towards the end of the the, the right time and. Um, Maybe you just sort of like pulls them out of whatever few state they've been in while they've been waiting for the page to sort of. But, use them sparingly. Um, if you have too many progress indicators on your site, um, people will take away the, the, the message that well, all the pages are slow to look at all the progress indicators you have. So just be really judicious. Make sure you use them on pages where it really matters. Maybe just on one page and, and use them quite sparingly. Any questions before we move on? I love talking about progress indicators. Maybe it comes back to the uh, question of uh, showing the result, but uh, circle indicators versus linear. Yeah. I don't think, I, from what I've seen, it's it's not about one being better than the other, it's how it's executed. Um, and, 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 and I can speak just anecdotally. Um, uh, I was using a certain um, car uh, taxi service on my phone that I'm not going to name. And um, the circle just kept going around and around and around and around. And it never stopped going around. I actually waited thinking, okay, I don't even, I don't even want the ride anymore. Like, I'm probably going to cancel as soon as, as something pops up because I'm so annoyed. But I just wanted to see if it would ever actually, the, page, the, the, the app would ever load. And it didn't. So, um, yeah, the endless spinning loop was very frustrating. Oh, yeah? Uh, doesn't, I don't know, I do, but I, I don't know if this is, you probably have numbers on this and I'd be curious about them. Um, when something sticks for more than five seconds, I usually assume it's broke uh, and junk it before it does any real damage. <laughs> uh, 
because it takes about 10 seconds to download a major worm onto your system. Oh, interesting. Okay, so the question, so, so sorry, I, I cut you off. So are you, are you just kind of bringing that up as a topic, as, a, as, a, as an idea, um, that for some visitors to a page, you know, you bounce after five seconds and nothing's really happening because um, for people who are in the know, you know that it takes about 10 seconds for a worm to download on your page. So if nothing else is happening, you know, you, you, like maybe, maybe, maybe something dire is happening. And I don't know that there's any research about that specifically, but I do know that there's um, kind of related um, when like survey-based stuff around how when people do online transactions. Like one of the when, so we've done surveys where we ask people what are your what are your biggest beefs about how you use the web, specifically retail. And the number one concern that people have when they're online buying stuff is security. Not surprisingly, they worry about giving out their credit card information. And then um, after that is speed and availability and page crashes and, and, and all the usual suspects. Um, and there's a interesting survey result that was just asking people what, what do you what do you think is happening when our pages are slow when you're checking out and what people worry about when when, when the the the, the um, the, tra the final transaction page time. If pages are slow, things that people worry about are, is my credit card information being pirated or hacked somehow? They, people worry about that. They worry um, about, um, is the transaction actually happening? Is it completing? Um, do I need to click the button again? I mean, that whole, that whole thing says, do not click button again. You know, people click the button again anyways because they don't, they don't know. Or and, and they worry, like, well, is the transaction, you know, they start to worry about the transaction failing. And so I don't have any hard and fast numbers about when that worrying happens, but the, the, the survey-based stuff is says that people do worry about security and they worry about failed transactions. They worry about, even when it does finish, they just kind of lost their, their feeling of comfort around the whole transaction. So you may have converted them to a paying customer on that visit to your site, but what you've done to their ability to, to their, their desire to return and buy from you again is, is, is questionable. Um, what's the other thing they worry? Oh, and the, and the other thing they worry about is just that their credit card is bill, but their item's not going to arrive. Like people, this this is something people say in surveys. That, you know, they, they, they really do lose faith in the whole the whole process. So images. Um, as oh, yes. Another question on status and period. What about the state changes that happen too fast? That's a really good point, and I wish that I had actually thought to prepare for that question. Because <laughs> there has been some really good research around that. Jake Nielsen's done some, some other people have done some, where um, he actually wrote a post that was, I mean, it's a bit of an edge case, but it's definitely real, where pages, when page elements actually load too quickly, people don't see them. They're not aware that they're there. Oh, okay. Okay, so so yeah, so so kind of circling back to that to that question as well. Um, so there is such thing as as too fast, um, and uh, it, it, I believe that um, one of the areas that's affected by that is navigation. So if the navigation elements are, are low too quickly or are almost too responsive and move around a lot, people have issues with that. There might be some other design related issues around that though because I find that like the trend now towards navigation being really tight, fonts being really small, I mean that we're, we're starting to move away from that again, but there might be some design issues that are affecting that as well. Yes? Have you got any numbers or opinions on partial rendering? Uh, when a, a page comes up and some parts of it render right away, in case you want to eat, um, sometimes on Google they, they put up stuff so you can make a choice before the rest of the page renders, you can choose to go to the next page. Oh, uh, yeah. so, so what's the question? Like just Partial renderings, do you think that's better than a progress bar or do you, uh, or do you have any numbers that explain what people think of, of putting part of a picture on or a low res image on and then raising the image re resolution over time. So the question is about, um, what, are, are there any numbers, have there been any studies around um, partially rendering a page or how we can partially render a page so we're serving people something? And I actually do have some stuff that I'm going to be getting to in this, in this section, so it's a good time of the question. Uh, okay. All right, so images, we know pages are huge. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the HTTP archive. If you're not, I recommend checking it out. It's really cool. Um, you can get it, go in there and look at um, uh, data for, I think it's about a, the top half million uh, websites in terms of, of, of popularity, and just look at how it constructed, uh, trends over time since 2009, 
That's 11. I should know this. Um, so one of the interesting things about uh, the HD archive is you can see how page, pages can grow over time. And this, the 1995 is a number, this come from the, the archive. It comes from some other data source. Basically, when you think about like, 20 years ago, um, we have a little 14.1 kilobytes. And I don't know how many of you were using the internet 20 years ago. It's, e it's easy to remember why, because it was like a gray background and like a picture and some words, and that was that was it. And then they centered the words and let you do cool formatting like that, and that was pretty fun. Um, so pages have gotten a lot fancier since then, and that's you know, a, a big part of that, obviously, is images. Um, according to the archive, mm -hmm. about two-thirds of the average page weight is compressed images. A lot of these images are they're, they're, they're too fat, they're not optimized, they're, they're, they're massively oversized. Um, people are using animated, Gifts in in hero images on retail sites. I've seen that happen. Um, so uh, lots of lots of fun things are going on with images um, that are resulting in waterfalls that look a lot like this. Um, producing images that take more than seven seconds, almost eight seconds. To, oh, sorry, that's yes, CSS. Sorry, um, but you've got some JPEGs there that are taking like four seconds. Um, so yeah, you get some you get some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, I look at a lot of waterfall charts, so I I've seen a lot of many things. Um, so, starting to answer the question that you asked about um, how people engage with images and how people engage with pages, this was uh, from some research that we did at Radware where, um, I, I, I don't know if you can read this, mm -hmm. um, we asked people when do you start to interact with the page as it pertains to images. <laughs> so, what was interesting was that almost half people said, this is text with yours, I'll start using the page, and you know, I, I don't. But, more than half, or about, yeah, just over half, said they wait for most or all images to load before they start interacting with the page. So you can think you're doing them a favor by having your navigation elements pop in there and that sort of thing, but if your images above the pool, and I know a lot of people hate that term, but for lack of a better word, I can say above the pool, um, the images that people can see, you know, if you've got, um, this chunk of the population, the internet using population, saying that they wait for most of all images to load, um, you realize that you have to make your images uh, work better. Mm -hmm. So we did some other research when I was at Radware, um, where it was more neuroscientific research, and it was around progressive JPEGs. So this was um, from 2014, I don't know, um, um, and at the time, um, what was starting to happen was um, the, the movement towards progressive JPEGs was, was not new, but it was really starting to solidify. It was turning, it was going from being kind of a, a best practice to a best practice that we must use progressive JPEGs. And there was some really interesting positive research around that, why, you know, why progressive JPEGs technically did render faster, you know, if, if, you're, if you're measuring them using a synthetic or raw tool. But we um, at Radler, we, we were actually going down this, this, this path of building some uh, really aggressive, progressive image optimization stuff. And we realized, well, actually, before we go down this very expensive R&D path, is it even going to make a difference? So we um, contacted our neuroscientific research company to do a study where we experimented with three different image formats, uh, baseline images, uh, progressive JPEGs, and then something we call perfect image, which is um, we, uh, and I, uh, I'm going to tell you as much as I'm able to tell you because I wasn't really did this part of it. Um, we calculated uh, the structural similarity index score for, um, for perfect images, basically meaning that we figured out at what point could you create a, an image, an optimizing image, so that it was as optimized as it could be without appearing visually different to, 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 to somebody. So we were really hard to, to create this image format for the sake of this study. So it wasn't released in the wild yet, it was just for the sake of the study. And we put them all side by side uh, and, and, and had people um, tell us how they perceive them. And what was really interesting according to this study was, um, so original is baseline, PI is perfect image, and PJ is progressive JPEG. And what you see is that um, the progressive JPEGs across the board um, had a very poor perception. People did not perceive the page as being faster. They perceived it as being slower. They were they were engaged less by the page than um, when we loaded baseline images. Now, 
I, this was one study, so I would never, ever, ever want to go on record as saying that I support changing a best practice or uh, a bit based on one study. We put this out there for other people to, um, to, to challenge and do their own research, so I would very much encourage you, if you choose to research this on your own, it is factors in your thinking. But you know, in this one study, we did find that just because we were delivering, a, you know, progressive content on the page, it wasn't necessarily helping the user experience. So, and we, and we were really surprised. We thought that, you know, we thought it was going to be perfect in this because we really liked our own format. Then progressive JPEG, and then baseline is baseline is going to be the one that had the major perception, and uh, this was this was quite eye opening. The reason why. We had um, another neuroscientist who is not affiliated with the study or with the research firm um, actually look at our data and conjecture as to why we had this result. And this was what he said. So um, basically, it's, it's this idea that, um, and he there's a long, long appendix to the report where we presented this data um, that, that that he wrote, and he got into talking about um, how our brains use glucose. So every decision that we make. Um, requires a little spur of glucose in the brain. And this is why if you had a grueling day and just making choices all day long, you get home and you literally can't even figure out, like, I don't even know what I want to eat for dinner. Just put something in my mouth. I just can't even. So um, that's cognitive fatigue, and we've all experienced it. And so the idea here that Dr. Lewis um, put forward was that. Um, if your brain is, 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 is doing the work of looking at an image right over and over and over and it's seeing these visual layers piling on, that's actually, if, if you have four layers to the rest of the image, your brain is doing that work four times as opposed to one time. And so it's that idea of reduced cognitive fluency um, that you're, you're actually working harder. And when we get cranky about pages being slow or about having you know, poor waiting experiences, what, what's really happening is that our brain is telling us, I'm using too much glucose, levels are depleting, this is dangerous, we could die. We could die from making too many decisions right now. So that's where the cranky comes from. It's not because we're jerks. Um, mostly. Um, in other words, I like that. So Kent Alstad is the VP of the acceleration at at Bradware, and he was my partner on the research on the Bradware side. He basically put that our brain is just like to have a big easy button, which is on, and, and and just make things easy. Don't make us make too many choices. Don't make us look at an image four times. Um, just just make it as simple as possible. Um, if images are something that you care about, and I hope you do, this is um, so a really great webinar that you can watch as a recording on the O'Reilly site from Back to Journey, um, just about how to do it, just make it fast, make it responsive. Um, I definitely recommend it. And for everyone, um, I, I'll be giving my slides to Sergey, and you'll be you'll be posting them. I'll post them as well in the folder. Okay, cool. So Sergey will be. Tweeting out the slides once they uh, once they're up. So well, let's talk about deferral. I've got a, just a few slides left, so I, I thank you very much for uh, for staying with me. Um, so we talked about deferral in terms of images. Obviously, you know you're, most of us are probably lazy loading deferring images that are below the fold. Um, third party content. Um, if you're not worried about third party content, you should be. Most people are. People are. Kind of uh, again, very upset about ad blocking now with regard to third party ads. Um, I have recently done an audit of some of major media sites, and it's really, really interesting. So, when I first started writing about third party performance four or five years ago, it was shocking, shocking. I was shocked that there were seven scripts on a page. Like, I was what? That's insane. Seven scripts posted in seven different places? That's what a terrible idea. Now, I look, I, I did, I've done audits of websites where 70% of the sources on page are third party scripts. So we're talking 70, 80, more than 100 third scripts on a page, all hosted in different places. Um, and that's, that's not going to change. Third party scripts do lots of great things for us. They, they, they let us understand who our users are, how our users use our site. They let us um, do ad retargeting, which even if we hate it, it helps our businesses more, make money and be more successful. Um, it serves ads, which are pretty important if you run a media site. And they do, they do a lot of things for us. Um, so they're not going to go away. I don't know how many people here are used to uh, familiar. Oh, sorry, yes. Did you have a question? 
Sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, anyways, uh, there's a tool called Ghost Tree that you can use um, that actually tracks third parties on your page, and you can do a few cool things with it. You can generate really awesome graphs like this. Uh, you can look at waterfalls of just third parties, and what looking at some of the graphs really reveals is that it's not just third parties that are the issue. It's fourth parties, fifth parties, sixth parties, seventeenth parties, to third parties making calls to other parties, making calls to other parties. And I have seen some crazy waterfalls where you just keep expanding the waterfall and it, it just it just seems endless. Like I've, I've literally given up on, on this a couple of times where I realized I think it was just this daisy chain where it just kind of went back to the beginning. So super crazy stuff. And you should care about third parties because obviously there's a performance hit, you know, um, a, a few milliseconds here and there don't sound like very much, or a few hundred milliseconds here and there don't sound like very much. But when you have that happening 70 times in your site, that adds up. So that's obviously one part of it. If um, you're, you're serving all those third parties to your, to your mobile users, that's the data hit for them. As somebody who travels a lot outside of my, my home country of Canada, I have been um, kind of shocked over the past three or four years by how quickly I can burn through my data plan now, just going to just a few websites. It's, it's really insane. Um, but there's a lot of security risks to third parties as well. So um, this is one of those areas where performance and security overlap. So um, it, it has all the fourth party calls do all these things, and it hurts you with Google as well. So if SEO is something you care about and probably do, um, managing your third parties is, is really, really important. So in terms of measuring, yes. How could you manage third party? I think it's very hard to. Uh, with, you know, it's an iframe and you have no control. Yeah, but you can use tag management tools. Um, there's all, there are a lot of tools out there that let you do that. The question is how do you manage your third parties? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there are more tools available probably well, than there have ever been before. So you can, um, uh, at, at, at SOSTA, we have it, we're, we're building it into our village monitoring, so you can monitor your third parties, same way you monitor the rest of your content. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a comment on the tag manager, though. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, when you enable a tag manager on a site, it gives a license to your business users to include more <laughs> the site. So, uh, you need make to sure here. it's a tool to manage it and not just an open door to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and I heard both sides of the like both sides of the argument, right? Like, you get uh, people in marketing who they just really need to manage tag, and they don't want to go through. IT to do it. They just they just want to do it because it needs to be done and they need to be able to, to, to customize it. But at the same time, I also, you know, I, I, I seen sites where they've done audits of the third parties and just found, found tags. They had no idea how they even got on the page. It's like a legacy tag, it's three or four years old. It's going to some crazy place or it doesn't even work anymore, but it's like still adding weight to the page. So, you know, uh, you definitely want to audit your third parties and manage and manage what they're they're up to. Um, there's a really cool tool called Spotomatic. Has anyone used it? All right, give a thumbs up. Sorry. Oh, cool. All right. Um, so it's just this, it's just a Chrome plugin. It's built on the backbone of web page test. It's made by Pat Meehan, who's awesome. And he uh, basically built it to let you, at a synthetic level, see what happens to your site if a particular third party just suddenly goes down. And so if your third party is asynchronous, you don't have anything to worry about. You do, you do, um, you run Spotmatic on, and you test each third party, and you see, okay, we're totally fine. However, if you're running a script that's not async, and not all your scripts can be, because if it's analytics, you need your analytics is, you know, to be at the top of the page. If it's ads, your, um, your, your ad providers are not going to be happy if you're loading ads last. So what, this is uh, uh, what uh, Spotmatic generates to show you what happens if a, uh, for example, a non-asynchronous uh, script fails to, to render. So basically, hold, you know, stall, 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 and finally resolves at 22.7 seconds. So just a really handy little plugin to use. Don't keep it on. <laughs> Don't keep it on, yes. <laughs> um, and then another uh, type of script that causes problems are pop-ups. So um, I used to do all these audits of the top 100 retail sites, and I would actually like 
get run the web page test to nine runs per, per site, um, and actually then get the median uh, median film strip for each one, and actually scrutinize the film strip for each site. So it was super fun, as you can imagine. And what it really let me do was um, see what are the what are the the, the stalling places on, on, on a lot of pages to render. And this was a really common one, pop-ups. So in this case, you get pop-ups that um, for this particular site, um, A, didn't even load particularly quickly, and um, B, you see the rest of the page is not rendering behind it particularly well. So not only is the pop-up slow, the pop-up is actually um, a bottleneck for, for, for rendering the rest of the page. So this is a user perception issue here, right? Because A, most users will tell you they hate pop-ups, although marketers will tell you pop-ups work. They're both right. We hate them, but they work. Um, so if you're going to use pop-ups, you need to follow some best practices in terms of making them making them friendly to your visitors. Um, you want to optimize them. This gets forgotten a lot. You want to ensure that they're functional across a lot of browsers, not just one browser. Um, you want to delay, ideally, um, when they appear on the page, so about 10 seconds when you can be sure that all your available content is rendered, and just from usability. But I find that it's one of those things that doesn't really get tested. People just introduce the script for the pop-up, but they don't actually test what is the most effective time from user experience perspective to, to actually have the, the pop-up appear on the page. It's kind of like, oh, just, you know, sort of insert it here, and it'll come up whenever, and yeah, bring this up your day. And then A-B test the pop-up for effectiveness. Like, is it actually getting the ROI that you want from it? Or do you even have, um, and by ROI for pop-ups, we're looking at, we're thinking about, like, a, what's, what's the conversion rate for people who are, who are seeing this pop-up? And by conversion rate, I mean, are people actually filling out the form, signing up for your newsletter, um, getting on your mailing list so they can get their one-time promo code or whatever? So you can, and you can test for all of this. And you, can, and you can see, well, if it's not converting people and it's posing a usability hindrance, why is it even there? You know, are you just doing it because everybody else is doing it? Mm -hmm. And then, the next, I think this is the final piece, um, is measuring, just what are, you, what are you measuring? How, you know, spend a lot of talk talking about user experience is really ephemeral, perception is really ephemeral, but at the end of the day, we have to have numbers, we have to be measuring something. So, um, this, I hope I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, first paint, is uh, not a good metric for uh, user experience. It's a good metric for other things, but user experience, no. Um, start render is a good place to start. Um, other uh, metrics for user experience, I really like speed index. How many people here use speed index or pay attention to that? So a few people do. When I was doing my frame by frame analysis back um, uh, when, I, when I did that, I did find that I, I would. Um, calculate what I call the time to interact, which is a manual score based on this manual um, observation. And I calculated it um, alongside the speed index uh, scores for the same pages. And I found that speed index and my manual TDI were actually pretty close. There were, there were always a few edge cases, but, um, but, but it was, it was, it's a good metric. So um, if you're not familiar with page test and using it, um, web page test is a thick tool. Um, it's a great way to kind of just get a snapshot of how your page render um, and how your competitor's page render. And speed index is, gives you a really good sense. And, and, and it looks like kind of a, it's a hard to understand score because it's four or five digits long. People don't know what it means. It just means the number of milliseconds before a uh, significant amount of content above the fold has um, so that's how to um, get some meaningful metrics on uh, using synthetic tools. And on the real user monitoring, real user measurement side, there's user times. How many people here are using user timing? Okay, so a couple of people. So um, I am not an expert on user timing, but I work with people who are. Um, so this is what I know. Basically, the, 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 my very crude definition of how it works is you basically create put uh, marks on the page, on the page elements that matter to you based on what you believe delivers the greatest value to users, which is what they want. So it might be your hero image. It might be, for some media sites, it's their headline. Um, so uh, everybody defines that metric themselves. And then you put this, this custom user timer on your on, on that part of your page, and uh, you, you can measure that in the browser, and your run tool, or, well, it's so our run tool supports that, and, and you can pull that in and actually um, uh, correlate that with all the other metrics. 
So for example, you know, this is um, you know, how it's going to take to display uh, a main product image on your site. So that's, that's an example of, of one way that you could use user time. Um, if you want to do a little bit deeper, here's some good blog posts that you can read um, on Steve Savage's blog and Pat Meehan's blog um, to, to um, just kind of talk about how to get those metrics. And then we also do have um, an ebook that you can download for free that was written by Nick Jansma, who's um, one of our very smart people at SOSCA, who um, like, well, literally wrote the book on how to, how to understand that if you use your time, you have each time and this first time, and how they work and how you can use them on your site, what each is good for, and the kind of pros and cons of each. And the final piece um, is just in terms of perception, it's just be useful. You know, think about um, uh, every user experience from you know, putting yourself in that user's uh, shoes, um, and make sure that that when they when they get what they they, they get, that it's something that's going to be satisfying. This isn't necessarily something you have control over unless you're also a content person. Um, but uh, just to kind of get back to to talking about uh, image possession, this is a, another Jacob Nielsen study where uh, it showed that. Um, serving usable content last is a really great way to guarantee that people won't see it. So if you, this is uh, the, the pages that rendered almost instantaneously, you can see this eye tracking study show that people stay up here and work the feature, the feature piece. Um, when there's an eight second delay, people's eyes stay down there in the secondary content and they barely look up at the feature content. So again, you want to make sure that you're, you're giving people what they want on the page when they, when they want it. Um, this is another example of what not to do. Um, and as I said, making the perceived value of content worth the way, make sure that it's, that it's good stuff. And um, I like, so I was showing this to, so I was at an event last night and I was talking with somebody about why, so I really love, this is actually, this is on the top 10 list of, uh, of, of best for four pages. This is the one from Bed Bath and Beyond, so and I have that answer, it's a great answer, it doesn't really mean um, But it's, uh, but it, it just said, it just tells you, you know, yeah, sorry, you're at the wrong page, the page is broken, you know, just maybe you came from an old link, um, you know, or something like that. But you get a fun page, that directs you somewhere else, so it's, it's kind of fun, it's visually interesting, it loads quickly. One thing that we know at Sosta is four or four pages are some of the fastest pages. If all your pages were as fast as your error pages, you could just go home and relax. Um, but it just shows you you can go to the homepage, you can shop what's new, you can shop by brand. But one suggestion that I had, and I was talking with some retailers last night, is why don't people put promo codes on this page? So imagine that as from a user's perspective, you you you, you can search, you come here from a, from a, a dead link, a, 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 and you get on this page, and are you going to click home or see what else is here, shop by brand? You kind of came there expecting something really specific. You might. I, I don't know what the numbers on that frankly are. Um, or you might just go back to Google and, and search again. But if there's a promo code on the page, it says, hey, sorry, this page is broken. Like, you know, you're really bad about it. Here's what I'm sent off. Are you more likely to stay on that page and, uh, and at least report the promo code and, 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 and come back to the site? Especially if you're a first time visitor to that site, you're going to remember that. Um, it's, I'd be really curious if, had, if anybody's ever done this or um, has any data on this, but um, to me, it sort of seems like a, 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 a usability and customer experience no brainer. So it's kind of thinking things through as a performance person, as a usability person, and also thinking about customer experience and actually giving people something really meaningful on, on, on every page of the site, even in four or four pages. And that's it for me. Thank you very much.